Good evening. I'm Deborah Gonzalez, House District Representative of 117, and I am so excited that you're joining us tonight, but even more so, okay, you want to see me fangirl a little bit? It's who I have right next to me. I, it's <laughs> I am a fan. <laughs> and uh, UGA Law School Professor Mirsa Baradaran, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing That's it right. Perfect, perfect. Um, but I am so really excited that she's here. She is the author of this book, The Color of Money, but also another book, which is The Way the Other Half Banks. How the Other Half Banks. How uh -huh. the Other Half Banks. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really excited about the conversation that we're going to have mm -hmm. tonight. But before we do that, I just want to give a little bit of a bio sure. so that people know why I'm so excited sure. that you're here. Mm -hmm. um, but Marissa joined the University of Georgia School of Law faculty back in the fall of 2012. She currently serves as a school associate dean for strategic initiatives. Mm -hmm. And as a J. Alton Horsch, Horsch, Horsch yeah. associate mm -hmm. professor, and as associate dean, she focuses on diversity and inclusion efforts, national and international mm -hmm. faculty scholarship mm -hmm. recognition, and her teaching portfolio includes contracts and banking law. So my first question is going to be, Mirza. What do you do as Associate Dean of Strategic Initiatives? I just I just started, and so uh, my focus is on uh, one getting um, you know awards and grants and things like that for our scholars uh, on the faculty. So getting our our work um, you know out there and, and recognized and funded, um, and the other is on diversity and inclusion. So both for the student body and for the faculty to. Um, do more sort of topical discussions on race um, and inclusion and to try to get our students, uh, more students of color and um, so just anything that falls in that bucket, that's what I'm going to focus on. But I'm brand new, um, so we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I just but you're not on. new to law. No, I'm not new to law. I've been teaching for about eight years and then I, before that I practiced. So I've been doing law for about 13 years. Very cool. And I mm -hmm. saw that you graduated from New York. NYU. Yeah, NYU. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Well, thank you again thank you. for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was something as, I'm, and as I was going through the book and some of the interviews which mm -hmm. you've done, and I saw that you were an NPR, there was something in the epilogue of your book. And, mm -hmm. and I want to read it to our audience because I think this is uh, the perfect way of putting our conversation mm -hmm. into context and why. I'm so excited that you're here. And, you, and I'm going to quote here that you say, to evaluate future reforms, we must absorb the lessons of the past and make sure that we are not repeating the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. You know, I'm a brand new legislator, mm -hmm. so you're new as a dean, I'm mm -hmm. new as a legislator. Mm -hmm. And the, this is an issue that has been coming up with my constituents that's mm -hmm. really important about what's happening and the mm -hmm. struggles that they're going through. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a believer that before I can do anything, mm -hmm. I have to learn about it, mm -hmm. right? And you made a statement in one of your interviews about the book that what the book is really focused on is to teach people mm -hmm. how we actually got to where we mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And sort of this history, this mm -hmm. part of black history, that's mm -hmm. not really taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And why is that? And, and yeah. then let's get into what that history actually is. Yeah. You know, it's actually funny. I had a conversation with a really good friend of mine who um, is aware and college educated and she's reading my book now and she says, you know what? She says, I, it didn't occur to me and she's like, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but it didn't occur to me that like, I thought when slavery ended, I, I it just, it didn't occur to her that there was any, like, she didn't know what happened between the Emancipation Proclamation until the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and I think, you know, and I, I was at first stunned, and then and then I took a step back and I was like, well, of course you did it, because that's not something that's in part of the national conversation, and, and I'm trying to fill in the gaps here. So, okay, I start at slavery, emancipation, and then I go through and I talk about the ways in which um, the, the markets, and because and, I look at economic factors and banks and how, capitalism works and how capital flows and creates wealth and how it doesn't and how uh, specifically the black community through law through policy through culture and through violence has been um, you know segregated uh, and, and and pushed toward um, certain uh, parts of the economy and not been enabled to accrue wealth in the way that others have and so the, the remnants of this this long sort of hundred year fifty year um, sort of 
efforts are still with us. Mm -hmm. and, and until we understand exactly how those laws were enacted, enforced, perpetuated, we can't understand how to unravel them. And, and while it is true that today those laws don't exist, so we do not have Jim Crow, thank goodness, we do not have the racial covenants, although if you look at the deeds in your house, as I have done, there was a racial covenant in my deed here in Athens. So explain a little bit what a racial yeah, covenant oh, is, oh. because our audience might not exactly know. Yeah. And if they look at their deed, they might not realize that they okay. have one. Okay, yeah, it's pretty appalling and apparent, actually. So have you ever noticed that Five Points is predominantly white? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that wasn't by accident. Um, so if you look at your deed, and I, I live in Five Points, and I... Uh, one of my students actually, uh, after we taught this and I taught this in contract law, went and found my deed and sent it to me. She was like, hey, look at this deed. And I, I just didn't go, but she was in the Clark County mm -hmm. offices and she went and found my deed. And there's a subsection of my deed that says, this house shall only be sold to someone of Caucasian um, uh, wow. descent. Um, and so of course, you know, I, uh, that the Supreme Court um, said that those, those were across the board, look at your deed if you live in Five Points or any of those areas, it's probably in there. It is unenforceable now. Right. Um, so the Supreme Court said in 1948 that you can't enforce that, but those deeds remained. I mean, it's like the contract. And they were never updated. They were, well, no. To so um, take it out. No, no, no. Um, and so, so, so it, it's part of the contract, it's just not enforceable now. So obviously you can't okay. go to court and say, it's there is someone who's not Caucasian living in the house, so, you know. But, but still, it used to be enforced. There. The fact that it's there, and then there's a culture that is created in these spaces. You know, there is the white flight that went to Oconee mm -hmm. after, you know, uh, the schools were integrated. You know, so, so that, that stuff was all um, very sort of uh, put down in law. Um, and so, and so um, I think a lot of people sort of think like, oh, well, the white community wants to live here and the black community wants to live there, you know, and it's, it's all by choice. And I think what I'm it's saying not. in the book is it wasn't a choice. It was not a choice made by the black community um, to, to live in those areas. This is what the law uh, decreed and demanded. And once, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the South and the North obviously clashed on several occasions, but in the North, certainly I'm not, this is not a book about how the racists were in the South. I mean, this mm -hmm. is, yeah, clearly, um, the North was just as, um, uh, you know, there was segregating and discrimin discriminating just as much as the South. Um, but, you know, this is, the, this is the, the legacy that we have to live with and deal with. And so to fix it, we, like I said in the epilogue, we can't keep repeating the mistakes of the past. And the mistakes of the past are ignoring the problem and hoping that markets will take care of it. And what I, what I try yeah. to explain is that um, wealth accumulates and, and the lack of wealth self-perpetuates. So, mm. so you can't get capital without capital. Um, and, and, and this is how white wealth was created. Um, you know, talk about the New Deal. You know, the New Deal sort of drew maps around the country and mortgage loans were subsidized by the federal government and created um, the suburbification of America. And so a lot of the homes that our grandparents got, they came home from the war, not, not mine, obviously, or mm -hmm. maybe yours, but, but a lot of Americans came home from the war, they got the GI Bill for um, their student uh, to go to college, and they got an FHA loan. And it was a very low cost, low interest loan. Suburbs were created all over the country, but these were racially explicit zones. Um, so the government, the HOLC actually created, this is in 1934, and the maps are still, they still have an effect to today. They created maps around the country and they, they marked them green, blue, yellow, or red. And green, blue, and yellow were qualified. Yellow was not as much, but green, blue were qualified for mortgages. So you get to go and have your FHA mortgage. Red was not. And the way that they drew the maps was on race. They were explicitly wow. race-based. So where um, the, the black communities were, those got red lines around them. And there were stories, appalling stories, like in St. Louis, a developer, a white community got too close to a black community. And so the developer, and, and the white community was getting denied loans, and so the developer just built a um, cement wall between the two neighborhoods so that the white community could get the loans. This was explicit government, federal government uh, enacted laws. And, and the federal government, I mean, it's not these obvious racists. They're, these are bureaucrats, and they were just reflecting 
the market dynamics. And th this is, you know, where places like our legislatures, like mm -hmm. we, you know, these, these were laws enacted by people in your position, mm -hmm. um, you know, not bad people, but people who were reflecting the market as it was. But what it did was to perpetuate ongoing uh, inequality. So two things that I want to pick mm -hmm. off of what you said. One of the things is when you talk about capitalism, uh -huh. And you're, you you make a distinction mm -hmm. about pure capitalism, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. the capitalism that we're actually experiencing. And you also yeah. mm -hmm. said something that I found fascinating because when you talk about that, blacks have really been the only one to experience pure capitalism. Yeah. Right. Yes. Versus mm -hmm. what what we usually consider as capitalism is really subsidized yes. quite a bit by government yeah. through things like you said. Um, the the FHC or those sure. kinds of mm -hmm. things yeah. that come up and and one of the other little stories that came out is you know we talk about the GI Bill mm -hmm. and how it was there for every soldier but yet yes uh, some of the black soldiers who mm -hmm. came back they just couldn't get into the colleges because yeah. they weren't segregated yeah so yeah. it didn't matter that they had yes that, right? there weren't enough black colleges to take the black um, soldiers that came home and they couldn't get the mortgages and and so so you have frustrated veterans coming right. home and saying I fought you know and I'm coming back now and I can't get all of these loans and subsidies that everyone else is getting but right this idea of capitalism I think I you know uh, I am not I am not I am a fan of capitalism it's just we've never had it you know we've we've always had government subsidized um, lending and credit and it's always been racialized um, so I'm fine if we want to say, okay, let's have pure Adam Smith capitalism. But Adam Smith was very specific in Wealth of Nations when he says capitalism relies on, and this is pivotal, relies on no discriminatory barriers of entry. So he was talking not about race, because obviously this was, you know, okay. a, a very racist right. era. But he was talking about, you know, these trade institutions and things like that that forced sort of licensing requirements and all of that stuff. And he says, that is anti-capitalist. Anyone with goods to take to market should be able to. But what was Jim Crow and segregation and, you know, uh, sharecropping, but impediments to capitalism, right? Uh, blacks were not given land. They were not given the jobs or opportunities to come to market. Um, in, in, the, in the broader market. They had capitalism in their own sector, but it was concentrated with poverty, it was segregated, and removed from all of the other sort of subsidized goodies. Uh, even mm -hmm. before the New Deal, there was the Homestead Act, you know, where a lot of people got land, you know, blacks were left out of that. Uh, so, so it's been a sy systemic sort of uh, and long-term um, discriminatory efforts. And, and thank goodness those explicit legal means ended. Mm -hmm. um, but what we never had is a truth and reconciliation. You know, a, um, and, 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 and it's the 50, 50th year anniversary of the Kerner Commission. And if you go back and read the Kerner Commission, which I recommend you do, I, I talk a little bit about it in the book, but the Kerner Commission um, was the closest we got in this country to a truth and reconciliation. So the Kerner Commission, President Johnson sends a bunch of economists and sociologists and, and to figure out, because after the civil rights laws are passed, the nation sort of has this urban crisis, they call it, right? So there's, there's violence and protests and riots, and they're confused, like, wh why? why? Why is this happening? Right, right. We just passed these civil rights laws. And so these uh, 200 or so experts study it, and they come back, and Johnson is livid with the report. The first report is like, blames everything on you know the government and you know these these red lines the police presence all and this so stuff. rightfully so rightfully because so they were He's identifying living. yes the, the 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 actual systemic yes causes of this exactly and the police and that the police had become and they they talk about police violence in there and they don't blame the police and i think this is a really important distinction i think sometimes we think oh the cops are the bad guys the cops aren't any worse or better than the rest of us. It's just their job to enforce the law and order. Law and, order. and so we create the laws, you create the laws, and then they go and enforce them. And so, 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 so I think that the report was very nuanced about this. Or don't blame the cops. It is all of white society that created this. So Johnson's really mad. He sends them back. The second report comes back much the same. He's like, white society created this problem. It's white society's problem to fix. And they talk about, look, the future is, you know, we can go down one of three routes. We can 
fix it, integrate, we can provide capital, or we can live in a perpetual garrison state, like a police state. And, and we actually never did fix it, because by then, the nation's roiled in Vietnam, Nixon mm -hmm. takes the White House, Johnson's just tired of governing because it turns out it's, it's, not easy. it's not easy, especially for Johnson, who was such an, I mean, Johnson's a really complicated character. Um, but, uh, you know, so we never dealt with the outcome of the Kerner Commission, and we have never had such an honest account of our nation's flaws. And it's right there, and if you look at it now, it's really striking how little has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this was, you know, 50 years ago. And, and I think we should just resurrect that report and look at it again. I mean, clearly update it for now, mm -hmm. but, but you know, when the subprime market hit, and I talk about it here, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, there's credit coming into these communities, but actually when Wall Street needed high cost loans, and I was on Wall Street at the time, so I know this intimately, they went and they targeted black and brown neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, the state of Georgia, um, Kevin Hagler's our banking commissioner, f fantastic guy, wonderful human being. He comes and talks to my class. He talks about, and we closed more banks than any other state. We had more wow. bank failures in Georgia than any other state. Um, and the reason is because the subprime crisis hit us hard, and uh, especially hard, mm -hmm. and part of it, and this is from my research, not Kevin Hagler's words, I'm not gonna put words in his mouth, but, um, <laughs> He'll get uh, back to me on Facebook. No, he's, you know. he is fantastic. Um, he's just a really smart, really good guy. Um, but we had, you know, uh, a lot of the subprime mar uh, loans were targeting black communities in Atlanta. And those banks that were servicing them all went down. Um, the black community nationwide lost 53% of its wealth. Wow. Um, during the subprime crisis. And, and it was because you would, you would have lenders going into neighborhoods and there was a thing called the yield spread pre premium, which meant that a lender would make a, a mortgage originator, and these were just like guys out of college, mm -hmm. right? Um, would make way more money selling a subprime loan than a prime loan. And so their incentive, even if you walked into their office and you were a prime borrower, their incentive was to sell you a subprime yeah, loan. Because they're going to get more money. They're going to get more money. And, and that was just the market incentive. And of course, uh, they were targeting black and brown neighborhoods. And, and so those were the, where the subprime loans first blew up and where people lost their homes. Right. Uh, and and, and, and the, they still haven't recovered. I mean, we talk about the recovery from the recession, but there are still a lot of black homeowners who lost their homes um, after the subprime market blew up. And yes, the stock market's doing well, but how does that translate if you don't have a 401k and you lost your home in the foreclosure? Um, so I think we, we tend to, see these stock tickers as some, somehow reflective of the health of the economy. But and it's only a certain portion Those of, of us who have a 401k um, are affected by the, the NASDAQ or the S&P 500, you know, um, mm -hmm. the rest of the country, a lot of the country is still suffering from that. But I want to go back to something that you talk about in your book, and I'm just going to take you back a few mm -hmm. years yeah. <laughs> to Nixon. Yeah, because oh, I, I love thought he right? <laughs> loved talking about him. I, mm -hmm. I don't know; he doesn't come across as that nice <laughs> guy. No, but but, but what think, was yeah. interesting yeah. what you bring out mm -hmm. is almost how he used mm -hmm. a certain message of black power yeah. um, mm -hmm. to sort of make the problem even worse. Yes, and mm -hmm. sort of say, "Well, now government's not involved. It's yes. all up to you." Talk a little bit about that and explain Absolutely. the history because I think that's really important so that mm -hmm. people can understand why we're here. Yeah, so the 1968 election I think is the most pivotal election in this century. Um, and, and I say this, I've studied it a lot um, and I, you know, I'm sure someone's going to disagree on this, but I just think <laughs> you had um, the country really splitting at the seams and, and, and Nixon um, took a route that further divided the country. And so you had a crisis. You had the, the rioting, um, you had the, the, the white backlash. Um, and I, I personally, I think a president like Bobby Kennedy maybe could have tried to forge some consensus mm -hmm. um, after he was out, uh, killed. Um, Nixon, uh, what he does is to do the Southern strategy. And we, sort, we know about Nixon's Southern strategy. So he decides that he just needs the the sort of George Wallace voters in his camp. He'll deal with the Northern Republicans, but that he does gains nothing 
um, politically for pushing forward on civil rights. He's very explicit about this. I've been in the Nixon files, um, spent a lot of time there, and he's very explicit. I gain nothing for pushing forward with civil rights. Yet everyone in the civil rights movement, especially after the Kerner report had come out like the year before he takes office, everyone understands that the civil rights movement is not done yet. Right. But for Nixon, it is over. And so how do you, how do you push forward and not send the message that we're over because you can't sort of you know get that get that um, get the backlash from the black community that's inevitable. So what he does is he co-opts the the black power rhetoric um, and twists it right. So he says yes, we want black power, and we want black businesses and black capitalism. And what he means by black capitalism is sort of what he means by law and order. It's not a direct. It's a it's a dog whistle. So okay. do, law and order is a dog whistle like more cops, we're done with these riots, we're going to go hard on these communities. And what black capitalism means is no government help, no integration, no reparations, no capital programs. You just are going to deal with it yourself with your own businesses. And that, that is the route he takes through the civil rights movement. And that route is followed by Reagan and by Clinton and by Trump and by Obama. You know, it's not something, and, and these presidents were vastly different from Nixon, and I'm not saying they were like him, it's just but they he created that policy strategy. Exactly. He created a mechanism that was affirmative action, it was, you know, minority businesses, it was, and then it gets changed into like diversity, and I know mm -hmm. that I am the dean of diversity, so I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to, knock on diversity, but what diversity represents, I think, is uh, representation. And um, what, what even Nixon, what he understood was, by black capitalism, was actual wealth and capital going into these communities, okay. right? So this was his program of affirmative action and minority business is a response to this racial wealth gap that the black community is pushing against. So he says, okay, fine, I'm not going to give you integration or reparations, I will give you black capitalism. But even that gets watered down to now we think of affirmative action or some people think of affirmative action as like reverse racism, you know, or it's tokenism, it's not doing anything. So even what Nixon was able to carve out has been embattled. But the truth is though that when Nixon says that, mm -hmm. he doesn't give any funds for it. He you doesn't know, give one, any of, one of the things that I get yeah. a lot of pushback <laughs> yeah. now from constituents is, please don't give us any more unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, in fact, what right. Nixon does, right? Yes. He says, here's the solution for it. I'm not going to give you any money. I'm yeah. not going to put in any programs. I'm sure. not going to set up anything. Yep. But go and do it and you'll be That's fine. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's, we see that it's even capitalism today, with, right? Yeah, it's capitalism without capital. Mm -hmm. Deal with the capitalism. <laughs> do it yourself. But what he means is figure out how to get the capital. And, and how do you get capital? Right. The, the, the way that the white communities got it was through these uh, leveraged loans. And that was very different from what might be some of the options yeah. that, that everybody else can do. And, and, and speaking of funding, I want to be, I want, I think we don't talk about government funding. I think the way we talk about like deficits and fiscal responsibility mm -hmm. isn't quite um, accurate um, because, you know, as someone who uh, reads a lot of economics, understands how the Federal Reserve and the Treasury work, um, deficits aren't, the nation prints money. The government can print money. So looking at the New Deal. So the FHA um, was this big pool of insurance funds that actually was profitable. Um, TARP, the way that we bailed out, bailed out those banks, trillions of dollars of bailouts, right. that was profitable. When the government spends and makes other people wealthy, that money comes back through taxes, through jobs. Um, so, so when, when, when legislators say, and I'm sure you're deep in these debates, like, there, I mean, it's different in the state house than in the federal government because the state houses unfortunately can't print money. But, but the but the federal government. Can you imagine if we could? Oh my God! We're in trouble. Please, no, not not this legislature. <laughs> Although, actually, if you go to the Linden House, mm -hmm. they have samples of money that cities oh, have yeah. printed, mm -hmm. you know, and I never realized that cities yeah. could do that. So yeah. that was interesting. But yeah. yes, we don't and want states printing out any money. Actually, and the, the, the title of my book, The Color of Money, um, when I went to run a search, to, has anyone else written about this? And there is a book called The Color of Money. And what, what it was was um, Confederate, it was just a, a art um, book um, of Confederate money that 
um, it is called The Color of Money, but it was a Confederate bills during the Civil War or, and before, and the bills actually had slave images on them. Wow. And, and I say, say the story, I think maybe in a footnote or something, but um, really, I mean, slaves were the currency of the South. They were the capital. And so this is the irony, I think, that, that goes when we go from slavery to sort of trying to get, push, push the black freedmen mm -hmm. into capitalism. They literally go from being capital to trying to be um, in capitalism, right? to trying to be the capitalist, but without any of the wealth that their bodies have created over time. Right? So, um, so, so yes, this, this Confederate money was very much slave-backed, um, and, and they were able to issue debts. But now, I think I want to I want to be clear that we're talking about government spending in a, in a fruitful way because government spending, it's not like it's going into some hole like you're dumping money right. into some like where is government spending going? It's going to employ somebody, right? It's going to build something that's going to come back in in revenue. So so we don't think about it like we think about like family finances or business finances where when you spend it just goes it's away. Gone. Yeah, governments write write checks and then they tax or it comes back. So. So when people say, oh, there isn't money to fix these problems, um, looking back at the New Deal, there was mm -hmm. money. And uh, that money came back like tenfold, right? When, when everyone becomes wealthy, and I want, also I try to end the book on a positive note <laughs> saying, because um, it's a depressing story, yes. um, as, as you, as you well, know. And especially for the people who feel, yeah. they're still in the struggle. I mean, yes. that's the reality, right? Absolutely. There is still struggle going on today. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I take away from the research in the book and, and the conversations that I've been having about the book and about this topic is the idea that, that we are in such a hole, mm -hmm. right? We need some kind of government intervention. Absolutely. Because without that, without the government stepping in and doing something, we do, this cannot be solved. Absolutely. Because the government, a government that works well, is not intervening. It is of us. We right. elected you. You are our representative. So I, I actually, I, I love government. A good government That's that works. Good I love <laughs> government. I think the, the, the best, the coup that Nixon pulled and Reagan perfected is this idea that, you know, the, the worst thing you, any American can hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That was Reagan's whole wow. thing. I think the, the, the um, malignment of civil servants and government bureaucrats has been the worst. And, and the left, I'm considering myself as, you know, as a, a, from, uh, as a member of the left, yes. we have not, we have not, we, we, we keep playing into that language. We keep saying, well, less government is, is good, but this is not big government. No, big government is awesome. Look at the best era in America, like when America was good. We're talking about let's make America great again. Mm -hmm. When are we talking about? The 40s, 50s, 60s? That's big government. We, mm -hmm. we were almost socialist after the New Deal, right? Mm -hmm. That's when America was great. Yes, I mean, we had these FHA loans, we had the GI Bill, we had a lot of government intervention. I mean, the government at the time, I mean, too much in my view as a banker, <laughs> the government was telling banks how much they could give you interest on, on your deposits, how much they could charge on loans. There were, they were re rate regulations on everything. It was a lot of state intervention. But people thought it was this, great. This and, Yes. Back off of regulation. You yes. see, you know, people don't want that. People don't want big government. But government has a role to play. Absolutely. Because government is us. Yes. A good government that allows voters, if we don't like our voters, to, a healthy democracy that allows us to elect out people mm -hmm. and elect in people we like, that's a government of the people. So insofar as we have that, and I know we don't have perfect voting and perfect um, elections, but... But government is not some external thing that comes in and takes your guns. Right. Government is our elected officials. Um, and so I think the way that um, we talk about government is um, not accurate. Um, and, and I think um, we need to talk about government as like, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Because who else is going to help And me? I mean that. And I mean right. that. It, it's not right. something that I'm just going to be here to help and people go, oh my God, we yeah. don't want your help. Exactly. But really that sincerely yes. trying to get to yes. these issues and what we can do yeah. to resolve Because who else it. is going to help you? Right. Right. Because go and, but like, we elect government. Yes. Right. So we want government to be for us. I'm Absolutely. just going to take a minute. I'm going to look at um, Avery over there and say, Avery, do we have any questions from our audience? Mm -hmm. 
any at the comments? Moment, we don't have any uh, mm -hmm. questions. It's been shared multiple times. We have a few people watching. Great. Of course, we're going to uh, post this yeah. you know, later. Um, and I think one of the biggest things, if I may, yeah. we're just mm -hmm. talking about government. And from one of the things that I gathered in your, your book as well, I think there's a negative stereotype today about welfare or government mm -hmm. intervention. Mm -hmm. But I think we all too often overlook welfare or government intervention in the programs that you were just talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And if you would, I think, mm -hmm. um, could you just take a moment to please remind people what some of those government interventions were? I mean, you mentioned yeah. the GI Bill, mm -hmm. and you mentioned you know FHA loans, mm -hmm. but your book does a great job outlining what a lot of these government interventions are, and I think people just don't realize that. Yeah, I mean, um, the the all of us are getting like Social Security. Um, you know, our, um, uh, like I said, the FHA loans that created wealth, intergenerational wealth for mm -hmm. anyone who got. So if your dad, your grandpa had that mortgage, you were able to borrow a lot from that, right? Not just money, but had that stability. So that gave you a better school. That gave you uh, an opportunity to a better college, right? Um, you lived in those white, wealthy suburbs, and those were government created. That, that was subsidies. Um, mm -hmm. all, and I do banks, right? So banks operate through a very, very, very heavy government intervention. The FDIC protects our bank deposits. The Federal Reserve saves banks when they fail, right? Look what happened in 2008. Right. We, we do not have the stomach for capitalism. Capitalism requires market discipline. And the market disciplined all the banks and they were about to fail. And the government was like, whoa, no, we can't have that, right? Because these, this yeah. is our money. Yeah. So, so knowing that, um, no, uh, so, so list of them, FHA, student loans, right? A lot of ways of the government, but, or Social Security, um, Medicare, Medicaid, right? All of these government interventions, yet, and this is again something that I think has been twisted, is the, you know, is Reagan's welfare queen, right? He says, oh, these are people out there wanting handouts. Yeah, that they're lazy. That they're that they don't lazy, want to that work. they're not they just working. Want to take, take, take. Right, and when you look at people who are poor, the thing they want most is a job. Right? I mean, there are ethnographies, and the one I would recommend is called $2 a day. Um, this uh, Catherine Eden, um, she tracks a bunch of families that are living in America and are $2 a day or less. And she asks them, like, what are your dreams? And their dreams are to have a stable job at like Walmart, because Walmart schedules were all over the place, and so people couldn't get childcare. Mm -hmm. They want a childcare and a job. They don't want handouts. People, everyone, right? Everyone wants their personal dignity, right? And so. How do we get people jobs? You can do a job guarantee. You can do programs that employ people, right? These are ways that the government can step in. And then once people have jobs, they create wealth, they become taxpayers, they buy homes, they feed back in. That is not money that is handed over. And, and, and so this is another area that's been racialized, right? When we talk about the welfare queen or whatever, we don't think of all the corporations that are getting subsidies or all the banks that got bailed out when they made really bad decisions. We don't think about that. Yeah, right? We didn't leave them. We know, did not to suffer those consequences. Yeah, those banks were coming to us for handouts, and we were like, "Yes." And they got them because they didn't pay them back. Exactly. They, yeah, I mean, not they, they just saved themselves, right? And and when people are struggling, we say, "Well, you must have made bad decisions." So, so Professor Broderick, <laughs> sorry. So Broderick Flanagan is asking, and you've touched on this. Mm -hmm. What does a viable solution look like? He says that elected officials often tell him, we can't do this, or we can't do that, or it's not legal. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like they kind of skirt around mm -hmm. the issue. So in your opinion, what does a viable solution look like? And again, you, you yeah. mentioned a few things. There's several things. I, I do want to, I want to, um, I want to be clear that individual legislators, you know, the way that legislators, as you know, like it's not like Deborah Gonzalez is going to fix it. You know, um, she can't. Damn. <laughs> okay, you know, uh, because, because of the way that legislator, legislatures work. But Deborah Gonzalez yeah. can educate her fellow legislators, gain coalitions, and go out there and, and do her darndest. And I hope that you do. But yes, what are we pushing for? We're looking at um, broad scale wealth creating programs. So. Does that look like jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Bringing jobs into these areas that most need them. Does that look like um, capital programs, right? Redevelopment, money. It's got. It's got to be a um, focus on these communities that are suffering. 
Are we saving them from foreclosures? Are we putting in capital, real funds into these areas? Is it about schools? I mean, there are so many ways to get at this, but one, but one crucial thing is to understand that all of it is tied into a lack of wealth. So the poor schools, the, the, the crime problems, all of, all, of this, all of these problems could be fixed by just getting people jobs and wealth and homes and all of that stuff. And so, and then that, and I think I want to say to, to everyone who is your voters and other Watching. constituents, yeah, um, even the, those who are not in those communities, is that we all benefit when, when we don't have inequality. So this is not a zero-sum game. Giving money and jobs into the communities that are hurting most should not feel like it's taking something from us. It is not. We all benefit. Professor Barabra, mm -hmm. we have a question here. If you were in one of these concentrated neighborhoods, mm -hmm. now segregation is still something that unfortunately has created neighborhoods, of course, where there is this perpetual mm -hmm. poverty. Mm -hmm. So if you are in one of these concentrated neighborhoods that was locked out of wealth building, what organizing approach would you take? I would get out and vote. I would get out, I mean, I would, I would, I would not, I would do, I mean, there's, there's things that you would do on a um, business level, but I think importantly, I would pay attention to what each of my legislator, legislators, statewide and federal was doing, and really organize around issues and push them on this. Keep your legislators accountable. Keep your nation, state, Local. across the board, local, municipality, keep them accountable. Like, what are you doing? Ask them. What are you doing? What is Deborah Gonzalez doing? She's reading, she's, she's educating, she's doing this. And then report back, please, right? So that's what I would do, number one. Number two is I would, you know, organize um, ways that people can't, there are, you know, short of sort of outside of the political process, there are, um, you know, uh, organizations, um, schools, um, colleges that, can help and should be helping. So, um, and then there are local businesses that we can support. Are there businesses that are really, you know, um, uh, building the community and employing um, people in the community? Um, who are, you know, uh, where are the big companies that are coming in Georgia? Where are they taking their employees from? Right? Are they employing and hold the right? Them accountable. Hold our businesses to accountable. Make sure that they're hiring. Yeah, and I was looking at like the top five employers. I was just looking because of Delta. I was so mm -hmm. mad that yes. we this Delta thing. But like Delta's the number top five employer. Mm -hmm. So are we going to Delta and saying, hey, you know, we love that you're here. Who are you employing? You know, uh, that kind of so thing. So we have another question for you, mm -hmm. Mariah Parker. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Mariah. Uh, she wants to know, do you have thoughts on how we get black people who have internalized the handout narrative mm -hmm. to reject it? Um, it's not your fault. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not, it, poverty is not a choice that people have made. It is, I mean, you look at the way that structures work, um, you, you know, I look at things structurally and you say, like, if someone's grow, if someone is born poor, the data is that it's very difficult for them to escape that right. without real help. And then, so if you're born poor and then you stay poor in adulthood, I don't want you saying it's because of my bad decisions, right? I mean, it really, it really is a tragedy that we, we tell the poor in this country that not only are we not going to help them, but that it's their fault that they're poor. And this is my first book too. Not just, this is not just a race issue. I think right. we do this across the board, is we pretend like poverty is a choice. Not, not to say that people who are poor make, don't make bad choices. I make bad choices, right? People, say, people always say, like, oh, we're going to do financial education just for the poor. Well, like, those of us who are wealthy don't know what to do with our money either. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not wealthy, I'm, but I've got right. enough money. I just don't need to sweat it, right? right? But the studies show again and again that poor people are actually much smarter with their money because they have to be. Well, right? they have to make it. They, last. Have, they, they have, have to, to make it last it. long. They have like, to be very yes. effective with it. Exactly. There's one study that has people coming out of a grocery store, and middle class people and poor people, and they ask someone who's middle class coming out of the grocery store, and I attest that I would do this, how much did your whole bill cost? They just walked out. Mm -hmm. And how much did, give me a few items in here, how much did it cost? No idea. I don't know, like roughly a hundred, a couple hundred dollars. I have no idea. I don't know. I just go 
get what I need, and I walk to my car. Because but you're not worried. I'm you're not, not worried. watching your penny. Exactly. To see if you have enough to pay. Exactly. But you ask someone that's poor, how much does the whole bill cost? They can tell you to, to the, cent. the cent. How much does the toothpaste cost? To, 260 whatever. I don't even know how much toothpaste mm -hmm. costs, honestly, right? But, but and, and I, I work in my first book, I talk about payday lending, right? People say, oh, this is just such a stupid decision. Well, give them an option, right? If you're in those neighborhoods, a payday lender is the only place you can go if you need $500. Ask, ask people that go to payday loans, have you tried your other alternatives? And they will say they have. Friends and family, not an option. Banks, oh, please, right? Mm -hmm. It's only the payday lenders or the pawn brokers. Um, they can't get credit cards. So, so, so you know. Then we say, well, it's just a bad idea to get a payday loan. What, what but would if you, you have no choice, what would you do? Right. If you have no choice, that's and, yes. and I think that just talks so much to your point that poverty is not a choice. It's, it's not something choice. that has mm -hmm. basically been put to these people. You're born into it, and then yeah. they take away every opportunity that you have to even make your way out of it. Yeah. You know, and I think that brings back to the point that because it is institutionalized, mm -hmm. because it is systemic, government has to do something. Yes, because government created that. <laughs> yes. You know, and I think that's the, the key here is that we're not just helping people who buy, they fell into poverty accidentally. <laughs> Nobody does we, that. <laughs> no, we, we mapped up these areas, we segregated, and specifically on race. I mean, we're, we're always going to have inequality. I'm not one of these utopians who say everyone just gonna, is going to do the same. No, I mean, some people are going to be Jeff Bezos and, and some people are not, right? But for those who have less, it shouldn't be so difficult to live life. You know, I mean, we should make losing in the capitalist struggle not so hard. I mean, there's tapeworm across the South. Right? We, not here, I think in Athens, but there are places in America where there are diseases that are devastating communities that they should not have those diseases. We have and nobody fixed talks that. about it. Right. right. We, we don't see it things. in the media. Mm -hmm. We don't see it in conversations. Yes. You know, even in the academic setting. Yes. We look Certainly away in yes. legislature. They're not talking about these things. That's right. Even the opiates, right? I mean, I think this is um, devastating communities that have been you know, looked over by the policymakers. You've got factories that have long left and then opiates are just ravaging them, right? They're, they start with the pain pain prescriptions and now it's this drug rampage. And, and of course, it's, it's, it's a bad idea to get hooked on OxyContin, but also the fact that so many people, it's affecting so many lives, it makes you wonder what structural things are going on. And I think a lot of us who don't deal with those issues want to just turn away from it mm -hmm. um, and I would urge us to, to not turn away from it I mean look at some of these uh, images um, yeah. read their accounts um, hear from these people these people are not that different uh, from us and I read these accounts and I always think in my head like but for the right but for the sake of right. God or whatever that um, phrase we have about two yeah. more minutes okay do you, yeah. do you have another can, question can you answer one more question yeah. okay so uh, Andrea Farnham she is asking what education curriculum would you implement to teach people about what the government needs to do to create wealth in the poor communities um, so um, what the government needs to, so I think I would I I always start with history um, I always say read um, so you can read the read. book uh, you can read um, there's a couple other great books that I would recommend one is um, when Affirmative Action Was White by Ira Katz Nelson. He's a historian and he talks about this stuff when we talk about affirmative action, but he talks about how affirmative action, government intervention has been used over the course of centuries for white communities. So he lays that out very um, explicitly. Um, I would read um, policy books. I mean, I just read one called Dream Hoarders, which was excellent. Um, this is again about people that's a who are, recent one. It's that a recent is, book, Reeves, yeah. yeah. New. Mm -hmm. And I'm on a panel with him in a couple of weeks. I'm very excited um, <laughs> to, to talk to him. But he, he basically makes this case that white middle class people, I mean, not, not necessarily white, but middle class people like us um, hoard community resources that should be for everyone. So we mm -hmm. hoard the gifted resources and the school resources and the community resources. And and the, and that you know this top because because he says everyone focuses on this one percent but there's this twenty percent 
Like, I'm not part of the 1%. I'm not Bill Gates or Bezos. I hardly, you know, I don't go on fancy vacations. I don't think I'm wealthy, but I'm in this 20% of people who has the means to set my kids up. And I need to be cognizant that I'm not setting my kids up at the expense of other kids. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where he really, um, and and I think his book will probably make some angry, but I think he's right on there. Um, And as far as policies, I mean, reading up about the New Deal, um, when I think America did well, and, and the New Deal did everything well except for it left out the black population. Mm. Um, and, and if we were to recreate it, but this time in an inclusive Include way, that. absolutely. I think going back to the New Deal, when, America, when American government worked, was beloved by all, or, or most, that got the benefits, and when it was profitable for the populace, you know, um, and then this time making sure that no one's left out. I wanna... Deborah, we have a question for you. Oh, okay. So uh, somebody said that they heard another representative speak about a bill that they want to introduce called the Stride Act, and they're asking if you have heard anything about that or know anything about that. I have not, but we'll certainly uh, put that on our list so that we can get some information, and then we'll post it on Facebook if we find any information about that. I do want to caution you, though. You might have heard about a whole bunch of bills, but Wednesday was crossover day, And so what that means is that if a bill didn't pass the Senate or the House um, on crossover day, it's dead for this session. So I have not heard anything about it. If they have any information, send it to us so that we can follow up and then we will put some information on Facebook Mm -hmm. as well as a link to the Kerma report that we were talking about and and, uh, maybe some of the books that you mentioned Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Was there anything else? I would just like to add on a technicality that it is possible it is possible for a, a bill to have the rules suspended and sped uh, through the committee. Yes, very so. rarely, though. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. If you want to know that. how the Senate works, one of the best books on the Senate is called Master of the Senate by Robert Caro. I would read the entire Johnson series. I would read everything Robert Caro's ever written if I were okay. you. Um, he is, he, there has never been a better nonfiction writer in American history, period. Um, and and his, his magnum opus is the, the Johnson book. So he's okay. written about Lyndon Johnson. There's five, six books total. Master of the Senate is the best, but he talks about the rules of the Senate and how bills get passed in the, the US Senate. But right, this is the federal. Here. But, but, it, but it's a really good insight into how legislatures work and how mm-hmm. power is grabbed. I would, I would recommend, I mean, if you can learn from Lyndon Johnson, yes. I mean, not, <laughs> not try to be as corrupt and as horrible as he was, but, but he got a lot done. Right. <laughs> well, before we go, I have a question. Uh-huh. Um, obviously, you're very passionate about this. Mm-hmm. How did you get into writing about this topic? Why does this interest you so much? Um, I was I wanted to read about this topic, and and the, nobody had written it, and so I waited and waited and waited, and I know banks and I know uh, equality, and so I I kept kind of wondering, you know, like, why don't I just write it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I um, so I, I've worked on this book for about eight years. Um, I'm passionate about injustice and inequality. I mean, I come from. Um, my mom was an activist, and my mom served time in political prison for her activism. Oh. Um, my dad was an activist. Um, so, um, you know, and then they mellowed out. We immigrated to America. I got here. I grew up very poor, um, and I've seen both sides. Uh, mm-hmm. I know what it's like to be really poor, and I know what it's like also to live the American dream. And I, so I believe in America. Um, and this is why, you know, I, I try to talk and urge people. I don't, I'm not cynical about what America can be. I am devastated by what I'm seeing right now in the political sphere. But that's, I, I, I have this optimism that we can do better. And I've seen in my lifetime us do very well. And what I'm seeing right now with the kids, like, mm-hmm. I am blown away by yeah, fabulous, what these kids are doing. And I just, I do hope that they take this on and, and help fix it or pu- and push us, the kids, to, to, to keep us accountable because we get lazy. Mm-hmm. Not, not you, but we as, you know, you're <laughs> no, out there, there fighting, but I think that I... you just get like, I just want to enjoy my, you know, cup of tea in my book mm-hmm. and not deal with the world's problems. And the kids are, you know, my, I have several, I have three daughters who understand unfairness very keenly. And when we pass by, you know, we go to New York a lot and 
they bring wads of dollar bills because they can't pass by homeless people. And, and I want them to keep that without giving money. And, and I think sometimes I'm tempted to be like, look, just look away. You, mm -hmm. We got to go. But, but, I, but I think kids are much more aware of people's humanity. And I think we stop seeing it. And, and I uh, hope that our kids keep us accountable. Okay. We are running a little late. Yeah. Yes. Do we have time for one more? Or Absolutely. I don't... Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Just yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and the reason I ask is because this is a very interesting question okay. statement too. So, somebody puts on here, uh, what does equity look like on a state level? Mm -hmm. The person mm -hmm. says, I recently asked someone about an example of equity and they started talking about transportation and access to the firefly trail and having shade trees on it. So what they write here is they believe different people from different backgrounds have a skewed view or basically different view of what equity looks like. So as somebody who studies banking yeah. and inequality, what does equity look like or what should it look yeah. like? Yeah, equity looks like ladders, the same ladders for everyone, right? Not the same outcomes, but the same ladders. So the ladders that my kids have, the, the opportunities, the, you know, uh, safe safe spaces, and I don't mean this in the sort of microaggressions, but the safe, right. literal safe spaces, right? They're, um, uh, you know, books, access to books, access to education, access to jobs, all of that stuff. Equity looks like everyone having the same ladders, and we do not have equity right now. We've got dramatically different early education, later education, um, just different tracks for different communities and equity looks like everyone on the same track like what I think my kids deserve mm -hmm. I want all kids to have that so that's what equity looks like on a state level on a local level I don't think we have to break it down it really is like we can do things on the state level but it, it also is about you know thinking about transportation talking to people right can you get to your job if you have one right why don't we have a train th to take people to Atlanta I mean equity yeah. looks like right there, I was just up in Atlanta speaking at MailChimp that has like 800 employees, really diverse company, young and amazing. I wanted to like get jeans on and work there because they all seem to be having such a good time. And I was like, why don't you hire from Athens? And they were like, so far. And I was like, you know, like we, we could be accessing that market if we could think hard about how do we get people out there um, and, and people who need jobs out there working at Delta and Coke and all of these major employers who could employ our most deserving citizens who need jobs um, and, and they aren't here, if, if they aren't here, or maybe convincing those companies who are have really good politics and, and a real investment in diversity to come here, right? Um, yeah. Very good. Well, I want to end uh, quoting your book again. Okay. <laughs> Um, because I really want to encourage everybody to read the book. Again, it's called The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap by Mirza Beradarin. Mm -hmm. And um, let me just read this. It is again from the epilogue. The point of this book has not been to propose a particular proposal, mm -hmm. but rather to demonstrate that past efforts of economic inclusion have fallen short and that any plan to bridge the wealth gap must include integration or a means to acquire capital. Based on these findings, there are many policy designs worth considering. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think, you know, I as a legislator want to thank you for coming mm -hmm. to start this conversation, start my education, thank right? You. Because mm -hmm. until I learn and until I know this history, mm -hmm. how can I even attempt Mm -hmm. to try to find some solutions at the state legislature. So now that I know you, I'm not letting you go. <laughs> and, and, and I commend I you. I commend you for taking this on. Um, it's not easy. I know. I know legislators like to get small hits and get these little wins. And this is a huge problem. Um, and it's really brave of you to tackle it. Um, and, I, and I don't expect that you're going to have quick fixes, but I will keep you accountable. Yes, I will. will. <laughs> and, and, I, and I do commend you for taking this on because that takes, like, balls. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and two balls. things that I will say is, one, it's also long term. Exactly. Right. It's not it something has to that I can do term. within 11 days that's left uh, in the legislature. But anything that you could do in 11 starting, days is not going to be right. the right It's outcome. to set that foundation. Absolutely. And two, that I hope that you will join me and some others as we put together 
a task force to look at one, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, that I actually wonderful. spoke with legislative council about this session to start putting those things in, you know, just starting it. What would that, that would look like wonderful. in Georgia? And hoping that maybe we can do Georgia a pilot a program of, yeah. of that in Athens itself. That um, and two, mm -hmm. just to be able to look at some very practical solutions of what can mm -hmm. we at the state legislator do? Because many times I get told yeah. <laughs> as a state legislator, oh, well, we have to wait till the federal government deals with that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to wait for them in Washington. What are they going to do? But I know that we have a lot of power here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in our own state and what we can do. So I hope. Yeah. That um, you don't yeah. mind if I give you a couple calls, Absolutely. have some more cups of coffee Absolutely. or tea. Absolutely, sure. And as we deal with this and see who else can we bring into this conversation, yeah. because not only will this take time, this will also take a broad coalition yeah. to be able to get there. And there are so many people in Athens who are thinking hard about this, who are really, I'm, I'm, I am blown away by the activism here and the knowledge base and the resources. And of course, we could do a truth and reconciliation statewide countywide. I mean, mm -hmm. let's dig up these racial covenants and just right. burn them up. I don't know. See, that's something that <laughs> I know? had no idea mm -hmm. about. And to me, it's like, you know, as a lawyer, yeah. looking at that saying, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Because even if we say they're not enforceable, they're still, they're there. still there. And I know the power yeah. of something just being written. Yeah. So, you know, to me, I'm thinking, okay, how do we get them out? We yeah. need to get those things out. out of there. Yeah. Um, because even the, the symbolism that yep. they convey, right? Yeah. Just from being there. Because our effects are still there. That's right. Yeah. Marissa, thank you so thank much. You. I'm so I'm excited honored. that thank you were you. here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank and you. We will be talking okay. again and again and again. <laughs> okay. Please, please read this book as well as her other book, How the Other Half Banks, because I think they're companion pieces as I read pieces mm -hmm. of them, you yeah. know, and I think they work really well. I want to thank you for spending some of your Friday evening mm -hmm. with us talking about these topics. We'll have some more coming up, so be on the lookout for that. And also, if you have a topic that you would like us to look at, maybe you have a suggestion of a speaker, just, you know what, send that in on our Facebook page and share this Facebook Live is being recorded as well, mm -hmm. so it'll be up there. You can share it with your friends, your family, your colleagues who maybe didn't have a chance to sit down this Friday night. But as always, we say thank you, and God bless you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank this you. Was